This is the Daybreak, aptly named because it represents a new dawn for the Korean Ear brand, our very first production model. Sporting a complex tribrid driver configuration of one DD, two BAs, as well as two next generation microplanar tweeters, a fully filled 3D printed resin shell, machine CNC aluminium faceplates, a high purity silver plated copper cable with 3.5 and 4.4 mm interchangeable connections, and tuned with the latest Care Type 5128 research in mind, the Daybreak embodies the Crin Ear philosophy, and that is to provide you with the best performance at its price point, 169 US dollars. The Cranier Daybreak is now available at hangout.audio, my very own online retailer with free global shipping. But for those of you residing in the US, the Daybreak is now available and in stock at Amazon. We're currently trying to get our Amazon stores also available in other regions, but as a viable alternative, we're also available on AliExpress. We're hitting the ground running with some regional retailers as well. Headphones.com in the US, Elise Audio in the UK, Audiophonics in France slash EU, Headphone Zone in India, Layin in China, Soundproof Bros in Thailand, Bass Audio in Indonesia, Zeppelin and Co in Singapore, and many, many more to come when retailers finally know of our existence and want to sell our shit. So if you like what you see and want to get a daybreak of your very own, well, links are all down in the description, so get yours now. But as with all of my new releases, there's still a lot of things that I would like to talk about. So if you would indulge me, let me get into the nerd shit. First, let's talk about Project Meta because I think it really sets the stage of why the Daybreak is such a huge milestone. The Project Meta was our debut model coming in at 250 US dollars, limited to 999 units, a move that was widely criticized by my many wonderful fans, especially at the point when we sold all 999 units within a collective hour. Why didn't you make more Crin? This is artificial scarcity. He's taking advantage of FOMO. As I've mentioned in my launch video, the Project Meta was a concept for my very own brand, my very own IAMs, where I had far more control compared to any other collaboration project. And after years of searching, we finally found a factory that could achieve our extremely stringent standards for QC, complete with premium materials, premium accessories, the whole shebang. Project Meta was perfectly to my specifications. I am 100% satisfied with how it turned out. But here is the big problem. We commissioned 999 units and these 999 units took our factory almost five months to complete. That's about 200 units a month. So that's really the ultimate roadblock for the Project Meta. It was an amazing, high quality product, but it came at significant cost, both in money as well as in production speed. So Project Meta as a limited edition run made sense. Once we finish making 999 units, things like production speed no longer matter. We don't have to think about the lead times for the next batch simply because there was no next batch. Now imagine in an alternate world where Project Meta was instead a full production model. Delays galore, people complaining about the long lead times, our customer service inbox will be fucking flooded. So now that we have set the stage, let's get into our biggest problem. How do we go from a slow production, limited edition run, to a full production model where we had to make IEMs as fast as you guys are buying them. The first point of business, of course, is to find a factory that was more specialized in high volume production. No shade to the people that built the project meta, again, extremely high quality, very stringent QC, but if we're going to sell a full production model that's even cheaper than the project meta, then clearly we can expect even higher sales month after month. Demand that even by their own admission, they probably cannot keep up with. The next step will be on cost control because if we are going to be making a cheaper model, then our cost would have to be significantly lower, especially if we want to spot things like regional retailers or even retailers like Amazon. So there needs to be that fine balance. Yes, we need to save costs wherever we can, but we can't do it to a point where our product feels cheap. 
So now we come to the Daybreak's first big marketing point, and that is our fully filled 3D printed resin shell. I've made my love for 3D printed IEMs no secret. First of all, especially when they have a transparent or even translucent finish, they look absolutely gorgeous and almost glass-like in appearance. And second of all, they're also a lot more durable compared to the equivalent average hollow resin shell design. And these are all observations based on my experience as an audio retailer. Look, demo units get dropped all the time at the Hangout, but in the instances where the shells get completely cracked open, they're almost exclusively hollow resin shells. So I put my money where my mouth is. When it comes to the daybreak, it is fully filled or bust. 3D printing techniques are also great because it allows for very intricate internal acoustic pathways inside the shell, which gives someone like me so much flexibility and control over the driver placement as well as the crossovers, which segues nicely into my next point. <laughs> Yep, this is probably the biggest elephant in the room. Yes, the Daybreak sports a tri configuration of a single DD subwoofer, twin mid-range BAs, and twin microplanar tweeters. And at 169 US dollars, the Daybreak is one of, if not the cheapest IEMs with this configuration. But if you know me and my work, you know that when it comes to the driver wars, I don't give a shit. But as much as I espouse how driver memes are memes in of itself, that doesn't mean that I think that drivers are completely useless. After all, every single driver in the Daybreak were custom developed for it in order to hit our target response completely analog. From the dynamic driver to the balanced amateurs to the microplaner tweeters, every single driver was hand selected and developed in service to the tuning, not despite it. Now, the microplaner tweeters were introduced to the critical cinematic universe in the dusk, so it's not like I'm introducing completely new technology to you all. But for those of you who haven't even heard of the dusk or even watched my dusk launch video, the questions on your mind is probably why microplanar tweeters? The newbies would probably hear the word microplanar and think to themselves, oh, Crin chose them because they are the best drivers ever, superior to everything else. And look, I am an open guy. Microplaners are great and they are perfect for the daybreak, but for more technical reasons than simply because they sound the best. For the daybreak, the main advantage that these microplaner tweeters have over the equivalent BA tweeters is where their resonant frequency is. Your BA tweeters typically have a resonant frequency around 5 to 6,000 hertz, maybe all the way down to 3,000 hertz. Now, this kind of response is good if you want an emphasis in those regions or maybe even a de emphasis if you plug them out of phase. But for the daybreak, where we want to have that extremely smooth transition from 3000 all the way up to 7000 hertz, BA tweeters don't quite make the cut. Now, before the existence of microplaners, and even until now, there is still a viable alternative, and that is the Sonian ESTs, the electrodes. Yes, they are electrodes. I refuse to call them electrostatics, don't add me. But then we run into some issues if we want to use the Sonian ESTs. First of all, they are extremely insensitive. So the moment you have a hybrid configuration using the Sonian ESTs, they are almost always going to be much harder to drive. Secondly, and this is probably more important, they are stupid expensive. Jesus fucking Christ. So if I want to achieve my goal of having the Daybreak be cheaper than the Project Meta, then Sonian ESTs are unequivocally out of the equation. Enter stage left, the microplanar tweeters, which have a resonant frequency of around 8,000 Hertz. Crossing them over with our custom developed mid-range BA drivers allows for that smooth, peakless response from 3,000 all the way to 7,000, while still allowing for that amazing extension from 10K upwards. But Crin, why are you so obsessed over this small little point? Is this the reason why the Daybreak sounds so good? Well, a perfect segue into our next chapter. So in the marketing material, I made it a pretty big point to emphasize that we're using cutting edge research as well as equipment to tune the Daybreak. 
So how exactly are we doing this? First, this is the Brew and Care Type 5128 or the 4620 if you want to be a bit more pedantic. It is the latest in ear simulator technology. It costs me half a kidney and it's what we are using for all of our R&D. This is JM1 calculated by Joel Merrifield and it's basically the population average diffuse field, which is based on the ear canal effects of the Brew and Care Type 5128 combined with the calculated outer ear effects of ISO 11094 one. Basically, it's the latest research in how an IEM can sound like flat speakers in a room and then adjusting that to taste. Because no one really likes truly flat speakers as room reflections, you have to add bass and tilt it down for people to like it. It's a whole other research as helmed by Floyd Tool and Sean Olive. You can read it up on your free time. So after a bunch of testing, I finally determined what my preferred adjustments are and then solidified them as IEF Preference 2025. Emphasis on the word preference. If you want to learn more about that, I've written an entire article on it on critical.com, so links down in the description for some further reading. I personally find it very nice. Of course, I don't find it as thin as Harman IE 2019. You have an extra heft in the lower mids alongside a base shelf that is low and clean, but still very deep and rumbly. The mids and treble on the Daybreak are also designed to be as accurate as possible per population average diffuse field. So the end goal is to have them sound like good speakers in a well well-treated room. This is maybe a bit of a pipe dream without DSP, but we're, we're trying, we're still trying. And yes, for those of you who are worried about QC, now that the Crin Ear Daybreak is moving into a full production model and we have to cut costs, let me alleviate your concerns. Earlier this month, I had visited the factory. At that point, they have made about 2,000 units, so I went down and picked out not 10, not 20, not 30, but 50 random units completely sealed, ready for retail, and then personally QC'd every single one of them. Here are the results of that QC. And I know what you may be thinking, Crin, that's just one big single multicolored line. And that's my point. What you're seeing here is the measurement result of 50 pairs of daybreaks, 100 total channels overlaid over one another to show you the unit to unit variation. Now the QC tolerances that I had specified to the factory would be 1.0 dBs for channel imbalance and 2.0 dBs for unit to unit variation relative to the golden sample. Now I'm not saying that we can expect absolute perception out of tens of thousands of units, but at least within the 50 random units units that I had tested, they all passed with flying colors. And so that is the Crin Ear Daybreak, the absolute best that we can do at $169 for now. This is a huge step forward for the Crane Ear brand and your support means the absolute world to us. The success of the Daybreak would mean funding for our future endeavors. And for those of you who have been snooping around, you would know that there are many different projects just simmering away in the background. And once again, if you are interested, you can always grab your own Daybreak now at Hangout.audio, Amazon, as well as AliExpress. Or you can support your own regional retailers for even faster fulfillment times and Touch wood, easier returns. So thank you all for sticking by us. We hope to see you again and don't die. Fuck off.